uh, thank you so much for the interview, Ted. Um, we, I would like to start off with our favorite question, which is, um, what's the why behind the everything that you do? Uh, I know you've been a um, lead developer for Drupal for a long time and been building websites even longer, and now you're a VC. So what inspires you to do what you do? So what inspires me for what I do is um, kind of a, a couple different things. The first thing is I really like helping people. I just naturally like to help people. I like to mentor them um, and really help them succeed. And then I also love to build things. Um, like growing up as a kid, I loved playing with Legos and just kind of building things. I loved playing SimCity. was one of my favorite games where I could build a city. And naturally, I kind of thought... The, the natural kind of progression would have been maybe I would have joined, like, uh, became an architect and kind of build, like, real buildings. Um, instead, I kind of went down the, the software engineering part where I could build um, websites and, like, massive websites with a lot of components. And in, in my head, it's, it's very similar to building an architectural building. It's very similar to building, like, a software um, website. It's a very similar architectural principles. And so, for me, the, the love of building things and the love of helping people is kind of what really drives me day to day. That, that's that's really nice. Uh, you've been a part of uh, this open source hacking culture for a long time. By hacking, I don't mean it in a bad way. Ha hacking to me is uh, simply working around a problem in a very, very smart way. Um, what are some of the values or ethics that you developed throughout your career that made sure you don't go off track? Um, so th things that kind of keep me on track, like they, they, when I look at coding and hacking and those kinds of things, um, is to always be um, enthusiastic and passionate about what I'm doing. And there's a great uh, saying online, it's David uh, Sia has this thing where it's like, it's like build, ship, mentor, and share. Um, I think I might have misquoted one of those. But the concept is like there, there's kind of these four steps to every process. Um, and it, you, you want to learn about something new, you want to build, and then you want to share with others. And when that kind of pattern to me kind of cools off, then I know it's time to learn the next cool technology or maybe build the next website. Um, and so my, my first phase is when I was going through uh, this open source framework called Drupal. I was just learning and playing with it, really loved kind of building things. And then I took it to the next level where we were building much bigger websites. And then when I got good at that, I wanted to tell others. I wanted to share through podcasts and uh, writings like how they could do the same. And after that phase, I kind of went into um, building a real stuff website, but that took about two years. We sold the company, um, and now I started a blog and sharing about it. And now I'm on the, the VC side for about two years, and so I've been building things, um, just kind of how I look at companies, how I invest, and tools, um, and I've been learning a ton of stuff. And now I'm actually just launched my new blog where I'm trying to share everything I've learned. And for me, it's always continuing in that pattern. Um, as I look at new technologies and new things to do. Right. Uh, can you give us some insights into open source uh, culture? Yeah, so open source development to me has been one of the most amazing experiences I've kind of stumbled up into. Um, I got started in Drupal back in 2004, so almost nine years ago, and it, would, it, it almost happened by chance. Um, I had a, a lot of day-to-day -day work uh, managing websites. Mm -hmm. And I worked in a small company. I was the only developer in charge of everything. And so I didn't have a lot of peers to kind of chat with and like learn from. And open source taught me all about that. There was, my peers were online. My peers were in IRC chat rooms. I was learning different techniques. I was becoming a substantially better coder. And I felt like I was part of like a much bigger tech team, even though I was a single tech person at my company. And when I met these people at conferences and uh, various talks, like, it really became real, and I felt part of something much larger. And to me, open source has been just a pivotal piece of my entire um, career, and just something I always encourage people to do and learn from. Because when you really act like are active in the community, you can learn so much from other people and really kind of step out of your own organization. Right. And and can you tell us what what is it that is making you? Fa become very fascinated about programming? So what became fascinating about programming is just the, the fact of like learning new things and building cool things. Mm -hmm. um, and I generally, like for me, um, I tend to be uh, just kind of very analytical and kind of procedural and I like things in order. Uh, but I, I really like just building cool things to play with. Mm -hmm. And for me, programming is a way 
if I have an idea, if I want a website to do something, I can just go build it. I don't have to hire someone or figure out what to do. I can just build what I want, and then I can make my life better. I can make a better tool for myself. Um, and so for me, programming is just a, it's a very hands-on tool that allows me to kind of um, build things and actually use them myself instead of relying on others. Right, okay. Uh, I, I know you have a lot of uh, interesting startups that you've invested in. Can you tell us what do you look for in in uh, before you invest in a startup? And so what's your investing best, mantra, if I can call it that way? Yeah, when we're investing in startups, the, the biggest thing that you see over and over again, um, the biggest question is like, how do you judge like the startup one from startup two? Like, what's what's the real difference? And to me, there's two fundamental different things. The first thing is the team behind the startup, and and then the second thing is how they're actually executing. And notice I'm not saying anything about the idea. And the reason for that is, I, I like, love to use this example. Um, so I always tell people, they, they say the best idea, and like you're the craziest, going to change the world. And I say, let me tell you about my idea. So my idea is, I'm going to get a, rent out a room, it's a, not a room, I'm going to rent out like a big space. It's going to be a, a busy street corner. I'm going to have about 10,000 square feet of space. And I'm going to put down all these tables and chairs um, and have this menu of food. And... What is it? It's just it's a restaurant. But if you look at it, there's millions of restaurants in the world. They're all completely different from like the decor to the type of food, the type of service, the cost. But they're all fundamentally exactly the same idea. And so when an entrepreneur comes to me and says, I have this great idea, I tell them, I don't care so much about your idea as how are you going to execute? What is going to be your cost? What is going to be the way you're different? How good is your food or your product going to be? What kind of icon? Kind of colors like that's the thing that really differentiates yourself um, and that's highly correlated to the people founding the company um, the team behind it so they're the ones that are actually thinking about how to implement thinking about how to build it and that combination of how you're executing and the team behind it are the two biggest things I look for uh, who are your mentors and what were the important lessons that you learned from them so for me my mentors actually are um, my biggest mentor has been my parents. And so growing up, they taught me a lot about the great work ethic and always just constantly learning. And for me growing up, things weren't handed down to me. And so we I had to work for everything. Um, and just at a young age, it really taught me like the, the quality of like good work and also the, just the attention to detail. Um, my father in particular is very detail-oriented. Um, and so when he starts a project, he makes sure all the details are right, like the craftsmanship is as good as it can be, um, and not cutting corners. And that's really just kind of been something I've carried with me just for every project, every work that I do is just like always attention to detail, um, always delivering on my promise and following it through. And so growing up, that's probably kind of the biggest mentor for me. Um, the other thing that's been kind of a mentor is not anyone in particular, but just the general open source community, specifically the Drupal community. And the community at large is just super inspirational. You have people all over the U.S. and the world just working on different projects, all different backgrounds, different kind of uh, uh, things that they had to work through. And it just, for me, it's very inspiring to see people so passionate about things that actually people are passionate about things themselves. Um, and so I think my parents' open source community have been just great mentors for me. And now that I'm uh, kind of on the VC side, um, Jason Mendelson, a founder who's just been a great mentor of mine, um, he's really helped me just kind of cut out the BS. Like, what's, how do you do good deals? How do you be a great entrepreneur and a VC at the same time? Um, and so it's just been very inspirational to work with. Um, and then also my, uh, my direct boss, Josh Linkley, who's the managing partner of Detroit Venture Partners, he's just been a great mentor for me, just kind of helping me to be a better speaker, to be more confident about things, um, kind of be just the more on top of um, my approach to this network of entrepreneurs. Um, and so he's been a great resource and just kind of love do I work with him you know, yeah, after that. Right. Um, what are some of your uh, memorable moments in your career? When you look back, uh, uh, these are these significant things that happened to you. Uh, so yeah. some moments for me, just kind of going back, uh, I still remember the first website I built. It was uh, probably like 1998, 1997, and it was on GeoCities. And when I, I still remember this day so clearly. 
I was trying to figure out, like, I could upload a picture to GeoCities, but I was trying to make, back then you had to, like, code it yourself. And I remember, like, making an HTML document and saving it and uploading it. I'm like, why is it just text? It wasn't rendering. And then that's when I learned about, like, encoding of files, file types. I'm like, oh, it's not an HTML file. It's not a text file. And when I got that first image to render online, like, GeoCities slash my village and whatever my name was, I was just like, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is online. And I remember my parents were kind of a little worried. They're like, you don't want to be putting things online. It's a scary world out there. And I was just so enthralled with it. Um, that was a great moment. Another great moment was when I actually discovered Drupal. And I jumped into the IRC, and I was still very new at it. And one of the top contributors at this time, uh, his name is Chix, C-H-X, mm-hmm. it was chatting. And I had asked him a question. And he said, give me a good response. And then I said, well, I'm going to be one of the greatest, I'm going to be one of the top troop developers in the next year or two. And he just kind of laughed and pushed me aside. And he was just like, we'll see. And then that next year or two, like I started contributing more and more and then actually leading development on Drupal, leading a lot of CSS and JavaScript changes. And then it really became a peer um, instead of kind of an apprentice. And it was just kind of for me like a fundamental moment. Someone said I couldn't do it. I just moved uh, Other couple of memorable moments is when we actually sold uh, our company. A uh, company I co founded with CTO of Parents Click. We sold it to Lifetime TV. And I just remember a month before we sold, we had some bugs and we had, some, we had an issue where we almost accidentally emailed out thousands of people and thousands of emails. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's like the worst timing. And going through that whole process and just Finally, like kind of reaching the end of a very long, arduous journey where we're out of money and just kind of bootstrap, um, and just being about to sell was just such a felt so uh, reassuring that I could accomplish things, being determined. And I'd say the next couple more normal moments were um, after we had Lifetime and then AD Television acquired Lifetime, that all the work and kind of my passion for the past five years was just shut down. Everything was completely closed and it just it was kind of a a sad moment that all the stuff I've been worked for and like we're still one of the best on the internet just kind of went away. And it kinda of made me realize like what did go away was my passion for just building things and sharing them with people and helping make their lives better. Yeah. And even when that product's come I can now can carry carry that attitude as I invest in new companies and new entrepreneurs and really help them and just kind of uh, take them uh, so you, you do, I'm sure you do a lot of things uh, every day. And what are some of the productivity hacks that you can share with us? Yes, yeah, so I'm a big productivity, I don't know, I don't want to say guru, but like I'm just a, a fanatic about it. I try out all kinds of tools. Um, I'm a big fan of the GTD philosophy. Uh, so David Allen, Getting Things Done. It's a great book, just kind of like how you think about organizing things. But it's not too uh, effective like in terms of how does that translate into a real active tool? Yeah. Um, and so what I've found that actually works for me well is there's this app called Workflowy. Mm-hmm. And Workflowy is a, a very simple outline tool. You can make a list of things. You can make sub-lists. And what i found that works well is I, I have my home life. I have my work life. And then under my work life, I have uh, different companies I'm looking at investing in, different companies I've already invested in, uh, different projects I'm working on. And then I'll organize it by here's the next actionable step that I need to do, something that is very clear. I need to email this person. I need to call this person. I need to uh, look at a cap table. Um, there's no vagueness in, like, to get the project done. It's very clear. Um, and so I like to have a next step for each one of those. Um, and then a clear way to kind of measure the effectiveness, like, is it done or not? Yeah. And there's a uh, framework I use called, uh, it's a management tool called Objective Key Results. And it's a very simple uh, measurement tool, but I like to set for different projects, what's the objective? What do I want to high level kind of achieve? And then three ways that I measure success. And they have to be things that are highly measurable. And when I start adding those and start measuring my project success, it just, things that become, things that are manageable become better. You notice like what's working and what's not. And so the act of actually just very simply managing something, just on a, a simple key number, um, can make a huge difference. And so that combination of workflow way to figure out what I need to do mm-hmm. and then a simple tool to kind of, I just use a simple spreadsheet to manage like, is it getting better each week or worse? It just kind of keeps me on track. Yeah. 
that's really really helpful uh, so i think we are down to my uh, last question what's one idea that you want to share with us the biggest thing i could say like the, the takeaway is just always be passionate about what you're doing as soon as like the passion subsides like you need to do you need to change it up you either need to change jobs change projects change your perspective um and i know it's easier said than done like how do you kind of keep that passion alive and for me that passion that my passion keeps alive by constantly reading things whether it's the news i try to read one book every month and i, I just want new perspectives on things and so is i'm constantly learning constantly changing my perspective i'm always challenging myself how can i do it better how can i improve it and i i want to make sure the passion's alive and i, I mean it's it's not good. it's not perfect because there's definitely a a period after we sold our company where it was my passion drained. I dreaded going into work. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I kind of was like a depressed and just kind of in this lull. And I'm now so passionate about rebuilding Detroit, Michigan from an entrepreneurial perspective, from a community perspective, and just investing in startups and helping them. And I've really found like a really nice alignment with my natural personality and my job. Just every day, I love coming to work, so passionate. Like I said, I try to read one book a month, and it's just always giving me new ideas and new insights. It always keeps me on my toes, and I never get bored. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much for the interview. Yeah. Awesome. It's been my pleasure. Mm-hmm.